God, I, I do feel like a rock star after that introduction. Um, thanks so much for that and to all of you for coming out. I have to say that uh, Julie also saved my bacon. In case you wonder what the you know romantic life of the writer on book tour is like, um, this time I have to blog um, for USA Today, which you might say is a redundancy, um, <laughs> about my time on tour. And the, the real problem is, you know, they want several dispatches a day, and the real problem is, you know, book tour, you know, mostly you're in airports and bookstores and your hotel room, and, you know, as I told Julie, I have nothing to say, really, you know, uh, hit the mini bar hard after tonight's <laughs> reading. Um, I mean, really, what you, you know, airport security. So Julie uh, gave me a quick tour, and Sarah as well, of uh, the Margaret Mitchell house, so I have a whole, page of notes I can turn into my blog about Scarlet originally being pansy and the, the fact that Margaret Mitchell collected erotica and other, other juicy bits. So I'm, I'm very uh, thankful for that. Um, and it's great also to be back in Georgia because actually I spent a lot of time here while reporting this book or researching this book, uh, part of which takes place in Georgia, but I was not in Atlanta. So good as always to be back. And I'm quite curious what, what's going to happen after my reading. And it sounded kind of cryptic. Um, anyway, I'm going to try and be brief tonight because I really want to hear questions from all of you and, and keep this as informal as possible. Um, this book really began for me uh, not you know it, here in the South, alas, but up in Massachusetts where I now live. But where uh, before I moved there about five years ago while I was sort of checking out New England, I stopped uh, on a road trip at Plymouth Rock, where I had never been before, this great icon of American history. Um, and as any of you who have been there know, it's, it's physically very unimpressive. It's basically this pathetic, cracked little boulder sitting in a dirty sand pit surrounded by cigarette butts and soda tabs. Um, locals refer to it as the Plymouth Pebble. Um, <laughs> But the real surprise for me after I got over that was a uh, conversation I had with a, a ranger at Plymouth. And I'll just, just read a, a few paragraphs from the opening of my book uh, about what she said. Claire Olson was a veteran park ranger at Plymouth, accustomed to fielding odd questions. The most common concern the date etched into the rock surface. Why did it say 1620, visitors wondered, rather than 1492? Or they asked, is this where the three ships landed, Clara said. They mean the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. People think Columbus sailed here, dropped off the pilgrims, and sailed home. Clara had to patiently explain that Columbus's landing and the pilgrims' arrival occurred a thousand miles and 128 years apart. Americans learn about 1492 and 1620 as kids, and that's all they remember as adults, she said. The rest of the story is blank. As she returned to county tours, I returned to my car, chuckling over visitors' questions. But Claire's parting comment gave me pause. Back on the road, I scanned the data stored in my own brain about America's founding by Europeans. In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue, John Smith and Jamestown, the Mayflower Compact. Of the Indians who met the English, I of course knew Pocahontas, Squanto, and Hiawatha. Um, that was really the sum of what I was able to dredge up from this period. And that surprised me, first of all, because I'm someone who's always thought of himself as an American history nerd since early childhood. Um, I you know, painted the walls of my parents' uh, attic with scenes of Civil War battle, and uh, every night before bed, uh, lined up my little plastic presidents in order uh, by my bed. My, my siblings thought I was an insufferable uh, nerd, uh, still do. Um, yet here I was in midlife discovering that there was this entire era of American history that I knew nothing about. And the more I thought about it, the stranger it seemed that Americans in general don't know much about this period. After all, um, we often express reverence for our country, not just common ideals, but the land itself to which we were all once immigrants. 
we've made a, a virtual fetish of the founding fathers of the revolutionary era, yet we're oddly ignorant and, and not very curious about uh, you know, the founding that occurred several centuries before that, when the first Europeans arrived. What happened when the old world collided with the new? And why is it that we've uh, essentially forgotten this uh, first chapter of our common history? And that was really the, the set of questions that set me off on this uh, long, strange voyage, which, by the way, uh, you were asking about the title or mentioning the, the title. Uh, that comes from an account of Columbus's landing in the New World, where he falls to the sand and thanks the Lord to the end to a voyage so long and strange. And that seemed to me to capture uh, the spirit both of uh, the voyages I was writing about in my own uh, in their wake. Um, and what I really did at the start was to hit the books. And the first thing I discovered was really that the true story of our founding by Europeans uh, is infinitely richer um, and more interesting than the sort of storybook version that at least I learned about brave Columbus and then leaping ahead to sort of solemn pilgrims in funny hats. Um, it's, it's really almost pulp nonfiction compared to that version, what actually happened, you know, cannibalism, sex, there's all kinds of great stuff in there. But I think what I love most about the accounts of early explorers and settlers, which are really the basis for the historical part of this book, um, is that they describe a, an experience we simply can't have today, no matter how far we travel. Uh, which is first contact with an entirely unknown land and people. Uh, what happens when cultures that have never encountered each other before, you know, meet on a beach uh, in North Carolina or Virginia or in the desert of, of New Mexico? How do they communicate, uh, get along, make sense of what they're seeing and hearing? Uh, no two stories are alike, and to me, it's a really fascinating study in human character and behavior. Uh, I should add that no two uh, nationalities or tribes are the same either. Um, and if I had to pick a favorite from this period in terms of the writing, I would say it's the French. Um, they tend to learn uh, native languages and are sympathetic observers of native cultures. But they also conform to national stereotype even four or five hundred years ago. They're French. So they write constantly about the food and the potential for making wine and the beauty of native women. They have a very sensual appreciation of the New World that the English uh, sometimes lack. Um, the first thing they do when they found their first colony in what's now the US in Florida in the 1560s is to build a bakery because after all, it's the birthright of every Frenchman to have a fresh baguette in the morning, even if you're in the, the wilds of America. And uh, four decades later, while the English are starving in Virginia, where they themselves describe the fish, you know, jumping out of the James River, you know, into their pans, but still they're starving. The French are doing pretty well for themselves up in frigid northern New England and Canada. Uh, in fact, Samuel de Champlain one winter founds the first gastronomic society in America, the Order of Good Cheer, and he and his men take turns going out to gather wild herbs and hunt wild game. So you gotta, gotta love the French. Um, but I think the most neglected players from this period are really the Spanish, who are the real um, uh, European pioneers of this continent. Uh, I was today on, I think you say it here, Ponce de Leon Boulevard or whatever. Uh, one of the things I, I was fascinating to me about doing this book was quite aside from all the figures I really knew nothing about and in some cases had never heard of, the ones I had, it turns out that what I thought I knew was all myth and misconception. I'm sorry to report that Ponce de Leon was not searching for a fountain of youth. He was only 39 at the time. Uh, but what he did find was a lush shore he called Florida uh, in 1513. And this was the first recorded landing by a European in what's now the United States. Uh, Columbus never got here. Uh, and I write about the Vikings um, 
who came here a thousand years ago, but they never got to what's now the U.S. They were in Eastern Canada. And in the three decades after his landing, uh, Spaniards sweep across half of the states in the continental U.S., not just the fringes of Florida and the Southwest. They cross the Appalachians, they raft down the Mississippi, they descend the Grand Canyon, and they even ride all the way across the plains into central Kansas, uh, much to the surprise of Plains Indians who have never seen horses before the Spanish arrive. Uh, another wonderful instance of first contact, in this, in this case, between man and beast. Um, I should mention that the Spaniards uh, introduce another animal that might be uh, closer to your hearts here in Georgia, uh, which is the pig, uh, also not native to, uh, to this, uh, this part of the world. Uh, Hernando de Soto lands an army in 1539 in Florida and begins marching through the south and he brings as a reserve food supply 13 pigs that quickly grows into a substantial herd. Uh, do you say herd with pigs? I'm not even sure. Yes, okay, a herd of pigs. And some of them run away, which is believed to have seeded, you know, the wild pig population that you're uh, still living with. Um, and also the first um, recorded, you know, uh, consumption of pork. Uh, is in De Soto's account. I'll just read you uh, a few sentences about it. It's not terribly appetizing. Uh, they're marching through Georgia. They've come north from Florida and they've run out of food. And at this point, De Soto tapped his pig supply, which had swelled to 300 from an original herd of only 13. He issued each soldier a pound of pork. This first recorded pig feast in the American South in April 1540 sounds distinctly unappetizing. We ate it, the Spaniard wrote, boiled in water without salt or anything else. Um, but De Soto was obviously much more significant than that. I talk about it in the book, uh, particularly um, uh, spending time with a Georgia historian, some of you may know, Charles Hudson at the University of Georgia, who's done more than anyone else uh, to map the route that De Soto followed. Uh, and he makes a very good point that this man, uh, in some ways, paralleled uh, Sherman through Georgia and, and had somewhat the same tactics, sort of scorched earth tactics, and in fact did much greater damage to the South than Sherman ever did. Yet no one remembers him, as Charles Hudson says. You know, he's not a Yankee, so no one cares. Um, <laughs> But I think he was getting to a larger point, which hit home with me because I did write an earlier book about Civil War memory, that we tend, particularly in the South, I think, to, to see history through a very narrow prism. Uh, really, those four years of the Civil War so dominate uh, our, our memory of, of history um, that we forget that Southern history uh, includes a lot more than that. Um, De Soto essentially takes a, a death march across the South, 3,000 miles in more than three years. Um, it, it's, it's really incredible by today's standards. He goes through every, every state of what was once the Confederacy. He's kind of a Spanish Ahab, really, uh, chasing this unattainable dream of cities of gold somewhere in the South. He had been with Pizarro in Peru and thought he was going to make another big strike um, he doesn't, and in the end, he takes down himself, um, most of his men, and untold thousands of Indians. Um, yet, if we remember him at all today, it's as one, the make of a car in the 1950s, or as the discoverer of the Mississippi, uh, which is, of course, nonsensical. How do you discover something that Indians have known about forever? It, but it turns out he wasn't even the first European to become aware of the, the Mississippi. It had been known for several decades. So like many of the figures in this book, uh, even the ones that I knew I discovered are remembered for the wrong reasons, and most of what I thought I knew about them were myth and misconception. Uh, I should add that uh, I think we have to be careful not to um, uh, remember the Spaniards with a broad brush. Um, and uh, in this book, I, I tell the story of some lesser known expeditions by Spaniards whose stories really run 
contrary to our stock image of Spanish conquest, is this sort of very barbaric, uh, relentless steamrolling of America, sort of the Inquisition writ large. Um, and one of the stories I tell in the book is about a man named Cabeza de Vaca, who came to Florida in the 1520s on an expedition that went terribly wrong from the start, badly led, Indians are hostile, and the Spanish end up fleeing from the west coast of Florida on very crude rafts they built. They float into the Gulf of Mexico, no idea really where they're going, and they're hit by a storm, possibly a hurricane, off of uh, present-day New Orleans, appropriately. And those that aren't drowned are, are flung ashore, naked and helpless, and taken in by coastal natives. Um, and in the end, only a handful of them survive, and they do so by becoming faith healers to the natives. They mix a bit of Catholic theater with what they've seen of native healing rituals. They blow on the sick and say a few Hail Marys, and the sick recover. And at this point, Cabeza de Vaca and three others start this incredible wander inland, uh, being passed to tr from tribe to tribe uh, as celebrated medicine men, really. Um, they're naked, they're uh, living much of the time on a, uh, uh, the fruit of a plant called the prickly pear, which I sampled for my research, and it's indeed very prickly. Um, until they reach the Gulf of California and then come south into uh, present-day Mexico, where the first Spanish who meet them don't even recognize them as countrymen because they've gone entirely native. Uh, essentially, this man who sets out to conquer America ends up being conquered by America. And he writes this incredibly vivid account of this uh, ordeal, which I should mention, uh, the three men with him include a black slave named Estevanico. Uh, to me, this is one of the great adventure and survival stories of all time, and it's also, in some ways, the first great American road trip. You know, I think it's fair to say that most Americans have no idea that these four men crossed the entire continent uh, more than 260 years before Lewis and Clark under much more trying and dramatic circumstances. Um, there, there are a lot of stories like that, and I think what I wanted to do in the end by pulling them together is sort of really expand our notion of what constitutes American history. Um, first, chronologically, we really need to push back the start date uh, much earlier than at least um, you know, I was taught in school. And I'm talking here obviously only about the European history because the native history extends many thousands of years before that. Uh, I begin the book with the Vikings a thousand years ago and then uh, move forward to this sort of neglected period between 1492 and 1620. We think of ourselves as a young country, uh, the new world, but we're actually a lot older than we think. Uh, we also have to really expand this story culturally to include all these other stories. I uh, wrote this book against the backdrop of the debate over immigration, and I talk about that only in passing in the book when I cross the border from Mexico. Um, but I couldn't help but be struck as I was driving around the country listening on talk radio to uh, uh, people in talking about uh, the threat that immigration poses to our Anglo-American identity while I was following this history of Spaniards and French and Portuguese and Moors and African Americans and Indians and many others who were here long before the first English arrived. Uh, you know, it's debatable whether we're in any sense an Anglo nation now, but we certainly weren't at the start. And if you were somehow able to beam back to 1600, when not a single English colonist occupied this continent, you would have said it was unlikely, even impossible, that we would be here speaking English today and that I would be living in a place called New England. Um, I just want to say a few words before I close about the other sort of track of this uh, book, which is uh, travel rather than history. I like to go to the places where history happened and uh, see what's there now, uh, see how the, the history is remembered, what its legacy is and also occasionally to go a, a step further and uh, try and inhabit the past, um, uh, which I've done in my previous books, and I did a little bit of it in this book, and I thought I'd just sort of 
end on a, on a light note by uh, reading a little bit about my time with uh, conquistador reenactors. Um, I, you know, for previous book, uh, spent some time as a Confederate reenactor, but I had no idea that there were people who marched around in, you know, 16th century Spanish plate armor to uh, reenact the exploits of Hernando de Soto and other conquistadors. And I contacted one of these groups, uh, they were in Florida, and they said, oh, come on down, we're going to a history fest, and uh, a couple of us are going to a history fest, you can come with us. Uh, this wasn't a reenactment uh, of the sort I've been to before at Gettysburg or elsewhere, it was called a timeline event, which means every era is represented other than the present. So you had conquistadors and confederates and seminoles and pioneers and Paleolithic men all wandering around this, this park together, uh, and then the public coming to sort of check us out. So um, I thought I'd just read just a little bit about uh, my, uh, my time there, if I can find where that is. And the two people I refer to, Tim and Larry, are my compadres, they're the members of this group who in, uh, invited me to join them. In the morning, Larry strapped heavy armor plates over Tim's chest, back, legs, and arms. A gorget went around his neck, beneath a high-crested helmet. This is my light summer suit, Tim quipped. Normally, he wore metal gloves and plates over his feet and ankles. Even without them, his outfit weighed 60 pounds. Larry's attire was much lighter, but just as eye-catching. Green wool jacket, green striped breeches, a green floppy hat, and knee-high black boots. He looked like a giant leprechaun. Larry's outfit, like Tim's, had been painstakingly researched and was modeled on the flashy camp attire of 16th century Spaniards. Tim flung a filthy white sack at my feet. Your uniform, Don Antonio. Reaching inside, I extracted a pair of baggy woolen breeches that reached only to my knees. Next, I pulled out a ruffled muslin blouse that looked like a nightgown. At the bottom of the bag lay a pair of leather buskins. Donning the blouse, knee pants, and slippers, I confessed to Tim that I'd anticipated a rather manlier ensemble. <laughs> Not done yet, he said, handed me, handing me a quilted wool doublet, just the thing for a hot autumn day in Florida, and now your cota de mayas. Tim had crafted the chainmail from flattened, interlocked rings of heavy wire. As he hoisted the mesh shirt, allowing me to slide in my head and arms, I felt as though I were climbing inside a chain link fence. The mail weighed over 30 pounds, and that was before Tim strapped on a belt, scabbard, and sword. On my head, he planted an enormous visored helmet with flaps that covered my neck and ears. All told, I was wearing 50 pounds of steel. Staggering a few feet, I knocked over a camp table and slumped awkwardly onto a tree stump. What now, I asked. The words echoed inside the cavern of my helmet. Take it slow and drink lots of water, Tim said, and resist the urge to use your sword on people who ask stupid questions. A few minutes later, the crowds arrived, clad in the costume of 21st century Floridians, shorts, flip-flops, and t-shirts. They meandered from camp to camp like window shoppers at the Mall of Time, snapping pictures of Indians weaving palm leaves or pioneer women scouring pots. By comparison, our camp offered little drama, two steel-clad figures standing in the sun and a leprechaun polishing armor. <laughs> what period is this, a woman asked, consulting her timeline brochure. 16th century Spanish, I muttered through my visor. Oh, it looks miserable. She moved on to the Seminole camp. Then a man stopped to study my chainmail. If you look inside a toaster, he said, you'll see metal bits that look just like what you're wearing. <laughs> Others were less inventive. That your shark suit? Need some oil? Hot? As timid warned, I felt like running them through with my sword. <laughs> Instead, I offered samples of the hardtack biscuits Larry had put on display. Earlier in the day, I tried one and almost chipped a tooth. Larry showed me the recipe, flour, water, and salt, baked until golden brown and rock hard, then left to cool in the oven, a process similar to case hardening and blacksmithing. By mid-morning, I was drenched in sweat. In theory, chain mail offered ventilation, 
but the heavy doublet I wore underneath trapped the heat and moisture. Tim's plate armor allowed air in the sides and seemed to command respect. So at midday I asked whether we could swap outfits. Be my guest, he said. The plate armor not only weighed more than chainmail, it poked into my kidneys, collarbones, and groin. The gorget was unbearable, an iron collar, and the armor was even hotter than mail. After 10 minutes in the midday sun, the plate on my chest felt like the hood of a parked car on the 4th of July. The Spanish didn't really wear this, I moaned. They couldn't have. In answer, Tim hurled a piece of hardtack at my chest. The biscuit crumbled on impact. Then he gave me a sharp blow with the butt of his musket. I was conscious of having been struck, but only just, as when someone taps your car bumper in traffic. Tim explained that chainmail was effective at blunting sword slashes, but it didn't offer defense against the fire-hardened arrows of Florida Indians. DeSoto's men, however, didn't just fight. They marched, typically 15 miles a day, across the entire South. When I took a sample stroll around the park with Tim, I lurched and creaked like the Tin Man. My sword, protruding tail-like behind me, kept catching on bushes and the wide skirts of pioneer women. As we approached a narrow bridge over a pond, Tim took firm grip of my arm. If you fall in, you'll go down like a sinker, he said. <laughs> Um, I think I'll leave off there. I'm, I'm so eager to find out what the mystery uh, coming up is. But after that, uh, obviously, welcome your questions and uh, don't be shy. Uh, thank you. This will just take a minute, just a second. Um, and I, I was remiss, I, I forgot to mention Atlanta Writers Club. Is anyone here tonight from Atlanta Writers Club? We love the Atlanta Writers Club and we are very grateful. They are now helping us fund our little reception, our, our food, and we appreciate you. Thank you, Atlanta Writers Club. <laughs> and um, now I'm going to introduce Bradley Hale, former chairman of the Atlanta Historical Society and a current trustee of the old Cahaba Foundation in Alabama, which has a direct link to the material in A Voyage Long and Strange. He has a gift from uh, Atlanta to present um, our author. I'm getting out of the way. Good God. That has been an issue for several generations, many generations in Alabama. It's a site of the Battle of Marbella, which was sort of big fight with the Indians where he killed I think 2,500 to 3,000 Indians and as uh, Tony puts in his book it rivals the Battle of Antietam as the number of people killed. In any event scholars have found nothing yet but Tony was referenced some things and suggested it was near Old Cahaba, which is the second capital of Alabama, 1820-25. So on behalf of the Old Cahaba Foundation, and if it were found there, it would increase terrific the tourism. <laughs> uh, and we hope it will be. I offer to Tony the only artifact found in Alabama of DeSoto. I can't imagine. Oh, here we have it. That's the truth. This is found at Old Cobb, or is this found at DeSoto Caverns, or one of the... Uh, uh, Anyway, thank you very much. That's, that's fantastic. And I, I do give Old Cahaba quite a plug in the book because whether or not it's Mavila, it's, to me, one of the most evocative sites in the South if you haven't been there. It's, it's, a, it's a very spooky ruin, really, of the Old South, and, and I enjoyed going there. So thank you. I'm, so I can use this now to repel whatever uh, slings and arrows you throw at me. So please, um, fire away. Surely they must, yeah. Um, in your book, you, you had many scary, creepy kind of adventures, you know, dying in the Australian outback. And is there one that stands out in your mind as being the craziest thing you've ever done? Uh, 
God. Um, interesting <laughs> question, sort of asking about the sort of many uh, extreme and sometimes silly things I've done in the uh, course of my books and whether there's one that stands out. Um, well, being in the outback, as you described, hitchhiking in a place called, appropriately called Cloncurry, where I later found out the temperature was something like 120 degrees. And as, if anyone's visited the outback knows that, you know, you can sit there all day and one car can pass. You better hope it picks, picks you up. Um, I think maybe actually it was a social encounter in, um, uh, when I was reporting Confederates in the attic, I go to a place called Red Bones uh, Saloon on the uh, Tennessee-Kentucky line, and I was writing about a, a racial murder there. Uh, and this was, this was a very rough bar, and as I describe in the book, I almost get, whatever, uh, ripped apart before I, I flee. Um, and I later told this, I was interviewing the police about this murder, and I said, you know, by the way, I went to Red Bone Saloon, and gee, I wasn't greeted real warmly. In fact, you know, these people really almost tore my head off. It was sort of a biker confederate, but it was not an I and they were all, it was a big meth lab as well. And they said, <laughs> you went into Red Bones? And they said that when the police have to make an arrest there, they just surround it with guns drawn <laughs> and, and never think of actually going in the place because it's too dangerous. So. I didn't really realize at the time, but retrospectively, that was probably one of the stupider things I ever did. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the question is why I conclude in 1620 rather than 1607. Uh, and I do, I mean, I talked mostly about the Spanish uh, this evening, but the last third of the book is really about the English in Roanoke, Jamestown, and then Plymouth. Um, because it's part of the peculiarity of how we remember this, that Jamestown, even though it precedes Plymouth by 13 years, still plays second fiddle to uh, Plymouth in our national imagination. And I was there a couple days ago, and I stopped in and talked to the rangers. And you know, they've had this huge 400th anniversary hoopla, and they've got new museums, and and I said, has it made any difference? And they acknowledged that still, you know, Jamestown is kind of the Avis of American history. And so as part of what I talk about in the book, that really, um, partly it's because this history was really created by uh, historians in the early 19th century who were mostly New England Protestants. And not surprisingly, they elevated their own forebearers at Plymouth and sort of diminish the role of non-English, Spanish, French, and of course all Catholics. Uh, but they also diminish the role of Southerners because, uh, and this, this gathered pace with the Civil War, it gave them added fuel to sort of regard Jamestown almost as Plymouth's you know, degenerate Southern twin, and that it somehow almost doesn't count because, you know, well, yeah, it lasted, but they were incompetent, and it was awful, and et cetera, et cetera. So to this day, we really, I would argue, Jamestown doesn't get its due. And as I discuss in the book, to me, Jamestown is one, an incredible story. Um, and again, it's another case where what we think we know about it is wrong. If you were to do free association with most Americans and say Jamestown, they would say John Smith and Pocahontas. Well, Pocahontas was only 10 when, John, when she allegedly saved uh, John Smith. There's no evidence of any romantic link, and if there was, it would be kind of creepy. Um, <laughs> but the real story is phenomenal, and John Smith, to me, is in some ways the first recognizable American. He's the first to really see that uh, America's wealth is not the gold and silver that everyone was chasing after, including the English, but it's timber and soil and fish and much more humble um, assets and that was really needed was hard labor, not you know, making this kind of gold strike. So I think it's, a, it's an incredible story and also one that in some ways is more predictive of American history than Plymouth, which after all is a small and ultimately not very successful colony of really kind of religious extremists. Jamestown is this corporate enter enterprise 
um, that leads very quickly first to tobacco, also obviously to African slavery, and the first legislative representative assembly in America. All this happens even before Plymouth is settled. So I would argue that Jamestown, like the other um, settlements I discuss in the book, are really uh, very important to American history before, you know, Plymouth is really the end of the beginning. It's not the beginning. So that's, that's why I ended in 1620 rather than 1607. Uh, lady in the far back, in the pink. Uh, most personally, can I just limit to, to this book? It's too big. Most personally surprising fact I've come across in all my books, I don't know, I would have to, uh, would require too much thought. Um, I guess I would mention two things historically in relation to this book. One is that um, the French founded a, a Protestant refuge in Florida, um, in 1564, so almost 60 years before the Pilgrims, there were Protestants here fleeing religious persecution in, in Europe, which certainly wasn't the way I was taught. Um, and in fact, this colony was many times larger than Plymouth. It grew to 800 people. Um, and it almost succeeded if the Spanish hadn't chased them out. Uh, so that, that one, when I first read that, I thought, the book I was reading was an art history book, and I thought, this art historian has his facts all wrong. This, this just isn't, isn't so. Um, the other surprise, although I knew about it, but uh, it's not just the European history that's lost, it's, it's the native history from this era. And one of the most interesting places I visited was just north of here, Etowah, the mounds of Etowah. And I'd obviously, I, you know, I've lived in the south for, I don't know, 15 years, I traveled through you know, much of the region while I was researching Confederates in the attic. And somehow I missed, I was so focused again on the Civil War, that all around us are, is this evidence of this unbelievable native culture. Um, you know, I think again, it was another of the myths I grew up with, that sort of America was a virgin wilderness when Europeans arrived, a few roaming bands of nomads hunting buffalo and deer, and that was it. Well, when you go to Etowah, and you say Akmolvi, the one near Macon, am I, I'm sure I'm butchering the pronunciation, Moundville in Alabama, many others, and the Spanish describe it in their journals when they arrive at these cities. These were huge and very sophisticated and very settled uh, societies centered on these, these vast you know, ceremonial mounds. And one of them near St. Louis, Cahokia, uh, is believed to have had 20,000 people. Now that may not sound big to us today, but that was larger than any settlement on the continent uh, until Philadelphia surpassed it in the late 1700s. So this was a significant um, you know, society that existed here and in many other parts of the country in different forms, Pueblo society in the Southwest and the Powhatan Indians of Virginia and so on. But I think it was a startling to me once I became aware of mound civilization. It's everywhere in the South. They're, they're, you know, it's all around us, and I at least had been largely unaware of it. I think there was someone right in front of you. Yeah, another lady in black. Describe how I write. Could you be a little more specific, maybe? Search together. Uh, rather chaotically. Uh, I tend to, I think maybe because I come out of a newspaper kind of training, I tend to actually to start writing while I'm researching. I tend to kind of do it all at the same time because I find, or I, I certainly discovered this when I was working in a newspaper and it, it carries over to books, it's writing that helps me figure out what I have, what I don't know, and whether I have anything. Uh, you can gather material and think that's great, but it may not translate to the page. Uh, I mean, I'll give you one example. I talked to a lot of uh, professors uh, for my research for this book. I love talking to academics. No one I'd rather hang out with, but the reality is they don't often work on the page. It's hard to communicate an hour-long interview with a, you know, a smart professor somewhere. There are exceptions. Charles Hudson at the University of Georgia, I have quite a bit about in this book, and several others. 
I think sort of writing helps you discover. So I tend to start writing, and, and that first version is always, you know, terrible. Uh, it's throwaway material, but it helps organize your thinking, at least for me. Um, and then, you know, at the last gasp, the last year, you're just, you're writing, writing, writing. Um, but I have to say, everyone's different. Um, there are some people who don't put a word to paper until they've got it all organized in a nice, tidy outline, etc. Geraldine, I know, will sort of read and read and read and think and think, and then just sort of sit down and it sort of spills out. And her first draft is, you know, wonderful. So there's no, I'm, I'm the type who spits it out and then revises and revises and revises. So there are no rules to this game, but that's, that's how I do it. Um, yeah, in the pit. The question is about my wife, Geraldine, who um, apologized in, I don't know, an afternote or something in her novel, Marge, for once, uh, describing me as a Civil War bore, which I actually <laughs> quoted her on when I wrote Confederates in the Attic. So, um, I, no, I don't, well, actually, funny you should mention that. She, her next novel does have to do with 17th century um, relations between early colonists and Native Americans, but I wouldn't claim in any sense it's inspired by, by my work. I think that was a, a one-time deal. But we do, obviously, we, I mean, nothing leaves the house without the other one editing it. She's on the second floor and I'm up in the attic. And um, Although I would say that um, I'm a lot less help to her now that she's gone to the dark side and started making stuff up. When we were, <laughs> when we were both doing nonfiction, I felt I had a lot to contribute. And while I mostly read fiction for my own pleasure, I don't have a clue. I've never written any fiction, at least not intentionally. And uh, I have no idea how to tell her, you know, fix this character or this plot point. Uh, yeah, in the back. It's a good question. If anyone couldn't hear it, she's, she started this book and saying, wondering where the crazy is because Confederates in the Attic, I spent a lot of it hanging out with Robert Lee Hodge, the, the bloater, and uh, my last book, Blue Latitudes, with the sort of heroic Australian drinker, Roger. Um, and in this book, I don't have one. Uh, I, I was certainly open to it. It's kind of whatever happens. I try and, and you know, really, Rob and Roger both kind of just arrived in my books. I didn't plan it that way. They just kind of appeared and I thought, yeah, okay, um, this works, or happy to have them along. Um, in one sense, it was a relief with this book, not having a constant travel companion like Roger. I was really down to 1% liver function after <laughs> traveling the, the Pacific with him. And, uh, you know, Rob, and yeah, it's kind of nice not to have to spoon with anyone in a trench at Antietam. It was a somewhat lonelier, more sober trip. I, there are, I would say, some crazies I meet along the way and hook up with for short periods of time. So I don't know what it says about me, whether I attract these people or what, but I think a lot of, I try and just stay as open to accident as possible. I think the best journeys are ones that aren't planned. And so whatever happens, happens. So it just didn't, uh, didn't happen this time in that way, but who knows with the next one. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, what is my... Uh, the question is what my next book is. I kind of dread that question. Uh, 
I hope there'll be a next one, uh, first of all. Um, um, you never know with the state of publishing and the written word, etc. cetera. Um, unlike uh, my earlier books, usually there's quite a long lag time between when you finish a book and, and when it comes out. This time, because at the last minute we had a lot of maps and illustrations and uh, doing all the, all the work on that, I really only finished this book a couple months ago, so I'm still kind of catching my breath. So I, I have some ideas. I can say it'll, it'll be American history, but I'm open to suggestions. So if afterwards you have a good idea, but no, I haven't, I haven't latched on to a specific topic. See uh, someone right behind you, yeah. Uh, good, quite an interesting question whether I ever have an urge to go to the Middle East and follow up on Baghdad without a map. Yeah, I do get the urge every once in a while and it, it passes. Uh, um, uh, no, I mean, I'm fascinated by it and, and follow it closely and talk to friends in the region, but I think the reality of the kind of uh, reporting Geraldine and I were doing out there um, required being utterly footloose uh, and kind of going off for months at a time and not knowing what would happen or et cetera. And I think we have a, a family on board now and I, I think it's just a little tougher to do that. And I think I'm a little long in the tooth now to, uh, to do that. I have toyed with doing a, a, a biography of T. E. Lawrence who fascinates me. Um, and I, I know, I'm sure it's been done, but I would really love to sort of retrace his um, travels to the Middle East, and he's a wonderful writer. If you have any of you have read Seven Pillars of Wisdom, it's completely over the top. I mean, he really is in some ways as presented in the movie, uh, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, um, but uh, I'm not sure it'll, to be frank, it'll ever happen, but I, I have that one part to where. Yeah. Very kind. Oh, it's just a, a thank you. I have this T-shirt, this rock star T-shirt that Julie's wearing, uh, and it is mostly independent bookstores that I'm visiting, and I'm very thankful for their support. Um, so it, it's great. And I, I don't know who sells books here tonight. Is this your own? Um, yeah. So, um, and I have to say, it's a little sad since my last book tour how many of them have dropped off off the map, so I'm delighted to hear there, there are a couple of new ones in Decatur. You're the rare metro area in America where, you know, there are independents springing up rather than folding, so um, very, very thankful for their support. Um, yeah? I have a big question. Yeah. Uh, two questions, and I'll, I'll address the second one first, which is about runic inscriptions found in New England, and you know that seem to be evidence of Vikings. I have a long chapter on the Vikings. I really enjoyed doing that. I have to say, reading the sagas and immersing myself in in Norse culture was great fun. Um, I'm sorry to say that there have been dozens of such finds. Uh, I live on Martha's Vineyard. There's an alleged rune on. Martha's Vineyard, they've been, what's interesting to me is they've been found not only in New England, in Minnesota, and in Heavener, Oklahoma, which is the one that's interesting to me because after all the Vikings were seafaring people and how they ended up in a landlocked state uh, isn't fully explained. I'm kind of sorry to say that, it, that to date there is, none of these have any substance. Uh, basically what happened is when the sagas were first published in English in the 19th century, there was kind of a Viking craze, and everybody started finding evidence of Vikings everywhere. 
Um, and the reality is that sort of glacial scratches or a farm tool can leave a mark on a rock that if you look at it a certain way, looks like a rune. There were also, also a, a lot of outright hoaxes. So um, none of them have stood up to careful scrutiny. So to date, the only confirmed Viking site in North America is in northern Newfoundland at Lanceau Meadow, which I talk about in the book. I went up there. Uh, it's certainly not impossible that they got here, but to date, nothing, nothing that stood the, stood the test. Um, your, your first question was, oh, okay, uh, about that you were taught that there were these kind of sweeping differences between Spanish and English exploration and settlement. The Spanish were after gold and the English were more commercial and running religious persecution. Uh, again, I think that's broadly speaking of one of the many myths we were taught um, in that the early English were really here for gold too. I mean, if you read about Roanoke and Jamestown, they were looking to get rich quick. They were looking for gold. In fact, at Roanoke, they bring a, a metallurgist to test metals, and they're very disappointed when they don't, don't find it. So I think that the differences are, are smaller than we might think. Um, and also, while it's certainly true the pilgrims came here um, for religious reasons, uh, generally speaking, I would say the English were less motivated by religion than the Spanish who were obviously after gold, but also very intent on conversion. Um, they were really, uh, might be too strong a way to put it, but they were kind of the jihadists of this era. They uh, had just expelled the Moors from Europe, and they were infused, they were really kind of militant Christian warriors, and, and that spilled over to America, and they really um, thought they could bring around, bring about worldwide conversion to Christianity. So gold is one stream of what they're doing, but, but God and conversion is, is a very big part of it as well. So uh, they, they were more, much more active than the English in setting up missions and trying to um, uh, uh, convert the Indians. The English, apart from, well, even in Plymouth, they weren't really that interested in converting the Indians. There were instances uh, in the 17th century uh, where they, they tried, but generally speaking, it was more commercial mission, and you're right about the trade. Um, they were more more focused on trade as were the French. I don't know if that answers your question, but yeah. What's your, what's your latest opinion on what happened to the lost colony of Roanoke? Uh, the question is about the lost colony of Roanoke, which I had a lot of fun with in this book, because it is, it's a, it's a fascinating mystery. These 114 settlers are left and never seen seen or heard from again by the English, except for this carving on a tree, Croatan. Um, and so I tell the history of that, but then chase around with some of the contemporary researchers who are still searching. I'm not really gonna give all that away, except to say that uh, the search is ongoing. I was in Roanoke three days ago, and an archeological team was arriving the next day to uh, once again uh, resume the search. Uh, I don't know whether we'll ever find an answer, but what struck me while researching this book, because I talked to a lot of archeologists, the tools of archeology span are getting so much more sophisticated, ground penetrating radar and all kinds of other things I don't really understand. Um, and I think we're gonna learn a lot more about a number of things over coming decades because we'll simply be able to find and date things in a way we couldn't before. Um, for instance, there's a lot of debate about whether there were fishermen off the east coast of the, the northeast coast even before Columbus got here, Bosque and Portuguese and others. I think it, there are a lot of people looking in that area and I think they may find a boat, for instance, that, you know, a Bosque design boat or something that might give evidence of that. So um, I think we're in possibly for some surprises over coming decades, but to date, nothing I, I can't solve Roanoke for you or tonight. I'm sorry. I wish I could. Yeah.
Good grief, big question. How do you see the world? I'm not flattered by your question. I'm just, uh, I'm not sure how to answer it. I, I, I don't know, is there a psychiatrist in the room? Uh, um, I don't know. I was talking to uh, the Paula, help me out here, the wonderful radio show you have here. Paula Gordon and Bill, I, I was, uh, we were talking about this a little bit today. And I was saying to them, I think part of the dirty secret of reporting generally or being a journalist, which is a little different from what I do in these books, but you know, sort of my training, is that it's not that hard. Uh, you're basically paid to be curious. And the reality is, if you ask most people a question, they'll answer it. Um, it's very easy to convince yourself that someone won't talk to you or that you can't go in this bar, whether it be Red Bones or somewhere else, and that's maybe going too far. But in general, you know, I've, I've done this around the world now, and there's a wonderful uh, Mark Twain line about travel, uh, uh, you know, being fatal to prejudice and narrow-mindedness. I think what you discover the more you travel is that people are pretty much alike the world over. And, you know, if you approach folks with, you know, openness and a little bit of courtesy and just sit and listen, they'll tell you amazing things. And in the 25 or so years I've been doing this, the number of times uh, somebody has refused to speak to me, I can count on one hand, um, you know, in situations you might not imagine, whether it's just walking up to Klansmen at a rally once in Tennessee and I just took out my notebook and said, why are you here and what do you think? And they couldn't have been nicer. Gave me jelly donuts and gave me the whole download. Um, once in a nightclub in um, Baghdad, I spotted Saddam Hussein's son across the room. He was a famous murderer. Um, I thought, well, you know, when am I going to get a chance to talk to him? And walked across and asked him a few questions. Didn't really learn anything, but he talked to me. Um, so I think it's, um, I think if you do that long enough, you realize, what the heck? Um, there's a wonderful character I talk about in this book named Humphrey Gilbert, who was actually uh, Sir Walter Raleigh's half-brother, and in a roundabout way, he leads to the English colonization of America. He fails and drowns, and Raleigh uh, inherits his grant to, to America. But, uh, uh, and he was a very extravagant character, but I liked his motto, and I'm forgetting the, uh, I think the Latin is quid non, which means why not. And I don't know, I read that and I thought, yeah, why not? What's, as long as somebody doesn't kill you, what's the worst that can happen? Anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but that's what I would say. Yeah. Well, I'm getting the cut sign, so is this the last? Or I think that was a cut sign. Yeah, one more, sorry. Yeah, well, it's very nice of you, and the question is about photographs. Actually, the publisher has done a website, uh, so they would be delighted if I broadcast that back. Website, you must go to the website, but it does have about 20 photos that I took, one of them from of the uh, Mi'kmaq Indians that I endured the sweat lodge with. So it's voyagelongandstrangeoneword.com, and if you go there, they have a little photo gallery. I used to take a lot of pictures, but I find that taking good photographs is as hard work as, as reporting and writing. Any of you who are photographers know that. So to casually take snapshots, I find uh, I don't typically have the time to devote to take good ones, and I'm embarrassed to share all the bad ones I've taken. So, but I did, uh, they did coax about 20 snapshots out of me, so you can see me in chain mail and see the uh, Indians I sweated with and various other things. But um, I, think, I think I'm getting the cut. I'm, I'm not going anywhere, so happy to talk to you individually, but think I should wrap it up. Oh, oh. One more presentation, too, yeah. really quick. Oh, my god. My name is Jim Langford, and, and I'm an archaeologist oh, and, and researched a good bit of the DeSoto Trail in northwest oh, Georgia yeah, and right. worked with Charlie Hudson yeah. on that. And I was also president or chairman of the DeSoto Trail Commission that commemorated the 450th anniversary of DeSoto coming to the southeast. We don't say celebrate, because the Native Americans are very upset about that, but we commemorate it. And this is the last, this is an artifact, this is the last of the t-shirts of the 450th anniversary. 
that says the 450th anniversary of Hernandez de Soto is from 1539 to 1541, and it even shows Mavila on the map. So there you go. There's your treasure. I should just add that I'll wear this when I'm in Alabama and Mississippi and probably start a few fights because, as he could attest, the DeSoto route is unbelievably contentious. But thank you very much.